Welcome to the Music and Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily Williams Birch, and this podcast, it exists for you. Whether you're a music lover, an educator, a choir member, each week we bring guests to the show to help explore what matters in music. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Music and Matters podcast. Today, you get a super short clip with our friends, Dr. Lynn Brinkmeyer and Miss Robin Lana. You've heard from both of these awesome educators and choral conductors and humans before in earlier episodes talking about their thing that matters. But today, this is a special ACDA advocacy and collaboration episode where we're capturing the institutional history of the advocacy and collaboration committee. Holy smokes, that word gets hard to say when you say it a lot in one day. But it's such an important part of what we do as educators. And I feel that this episode helps you understand a little of the history of the resources and the tools and the things we can do as music educators. This super short clip is brought to you by our friends over at the Kinnison Choral Company. Check out everything they have to offer to help make your rehearsals even more seamless and amazing and to empower your students to be their very, very best. I hope that you enjoy this quick conversation with Lynn Brinkmeyer and Robin Lana. Today on the Music Ed Matters podcast, we have a special advocacy and collaboration episode as part of our ACDA series with Dr. Lynn Brinkmeyer and Robin Lana. Hello, ladies. Hello. Thank you so much for sitting down. Robin Lana was the first ever chair of the ACDA Standing Committee for Advocacy and Collaboration. And Lynn Brinkmeyer popped in and was one of our chairs a few years into the process. I'm so glad you guys can come and share your stories today. I'm excited to be here. So great to see both of you again. Let's start with Robin. Robin, tell the listener, they've heard you before on the podcast when you were sharing your story. Tell the listener a little snippet. Who is Robin Lana? Uh, I am the founder and artistic director of the Cincinnati Youth Choir uh, that was started in 1993. So we're closing in on 30 years in another year. Um, I have served ACDA as the national chair for Children's and Community Youth, and then following that uh, with the Standing Committee of Advocacy and Collaboration, I've served um, Chorus America Board. Um, That's kind of in a nutshell. I've had the joy of getting to know great friends and colleagues from coast to coast because of all the work in our choral fields and the greatest people on, on earth as far as I'm concerned. Oh, I agree. What a great story. And Lynn, what about you? Well, I've been more in the leadership with music education. It was in the Northwest leadership there at the state and went to the Northwest Division and eventually ended up being MENC, which is now National Association for Music Education president. And I'm currently in Texas the last 16 and a half years. And I have a youth course that I started here when I moved here. And um, I'm now associate dean of the College of Fine Arts and Communication and the director of choral music education. So that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> I love that we bring such, we're all unified by choir, but we come at it from different perspectives. And I love that both of you are able to share such great institutional history. And that's part of today's episode. I want to talk about the history of advocacy in our field. I know that we've all been struggling advocating post the pandemic for different things. Some districts just struggling to have choir again or to be able to um, change precautions so that they can sing safely. What are What's the history of advocacy, both from the education side with the NAFME or MENC and from the ACDA side? Can you give us some of the history? Well, I, I can start with the When I was on the executive board for NAFME, MENC, I'll just keep calling it NAFME from now on so it just makes it cleaner. We really realized at that time, and that was uh, 2006 to 2008 when I was the president, we realized that the the bulk of the funds that were from fees of of all the membership, we were going to focus more on advocacy and less on professional developments for teachers because the states are doing such a fabulous job, job at each of the states. And we knew we needed to be front and center because No Child Left Behind was still all the ramifications of, of some of those challenges that occurred with good intentions from the legislators, I assume, yet there, there were the actual actions of uh, No Child Left Behind really gave us some big challenges. And so that's where the advocacy became really strong in, in NAFME. And I think with that, then reaching out to other organizations, it sort of rippled effect to different ones from there on. That, so that's my perspective. What about you, Robin? 
Uh, my perspective comes from ACDA and uh, Chorus America. Um, Chorus America has been a leader in advocacy for many years, um, largely focused on community and professional choirs, but uh, all of their work in advocacy has definitely applied to uh, everything we need to do in the schools as well. So it's they've been a great leader there. Um, as far as ACDA goes, historically, um, back in the beginning, there was an advocacy statement and there was some work done there. But because there was such vibrant work going on with NAFME and with Chorus America, um, it, and, and ACDA is largely uh, driven by volunteers as opposed to um, staff, which is just in the national office, but it's just such a big organization, um, that the advocacy part of it um, was not terribly active. But under the leadership of Tim Sharp and New Visions for ACDA, uh, he put together seven standing committees, and one of them was advocacy and collaboration. Um, and uh, the advocacy became a more uh, focused um, venture of ACDA to see what we can do to help our schools, help our, our colleagues across the country. And then certainly I'm very thankful that we were up and running when the pandemic hit because I think the advocacy and collaboration committee really took wings during the pandemic. I agree completely. It's interesting to see how these different things, it's always been a resource, but how it's almost specialized as time has gone on, whereas music education in general, advocating for programs. If you look at the history of finances in the school systems, there's that big crash of the early 2000s and again in the 2008-09 where budgets kept getting cut. So when you think about the resources available for advocacy and collaboration, can we start by defining what do those words mean to you? Well, I'll say because I wrote an advocacy book that uh, I had to define that myself. So it feels like I'm doing a plug, but I'm actually totally it, plug. It was, it was quite of a, a challenge for me to figure out what was advocacy to me. And in my perspective, it is educating and bringing awareness to everyone about the importance of music learning, the process of music learning. At, concerts are great too. I don't, you know, but the process of being a musician and all, all the things that go with that. So for me, it's education and awareness. I love that. The education and awareness of your community, of your school at large. Robin, is there anything you want to add to that definition or maybe speak into collaboration? Uh, I'll, I'll piggyback on the advocacy. When I first came into the advocacy and collaboration committee, um, advocacy was a, a term that I hadn't really come to terms with myself um, completely. And I had to really, like Lynn said, what is it? What is it to me? What is, what is it? Um, advocacy can take wings in many different directions. It can be advocating for individuals in our program and making sure we're providing safe places, which was one of the big focuses of the advocacy, advocacy and collaboration committee. Um, but it can also be legislating and talking with administration and, um, so there, we kind of toyed, or tossed around the, there's a big A advocacy and a little A advocacy. Um, and the big A is the, the legislating and the little A is locally telling our stories and making sure parents and administrators and bosses know what it is what, that we're doing and why it's important. The collaboration end of what this committee is, is uh, searching for um organizations or individuals that are doing projects, creating great ideas that probably re re result in advocacy, but that's not necessarily only that, um, that we can support one another with, um, find ways that we have um, threads that are in common with what we are working towards and coming up together to create, a, 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 to work towards a goal of a product. I love that. If I can follow up again, piggyback on Robin's comments, that one of the things that I found out when I was just into the leadership of, at the national area for NAFME is we would be talking about advocacy and people would, would come up and some would even shake their fingers at me and say, you, you, you all need to, you need to start advocating, you know, you, because adv advocacy at that time, the perception from many people, including me for a while, was these were people in power suits that went to D.C., 
and knocked on the doors of the congressional leaders or maybe at the state level. And that was advocacy. And it, as Robin's already talked about, telling stories, um, there, there's so many um, tentacles, if you want to put it that way, and the ways to reach out. And that that child that comes home and is so excited about their music teacher, what they learned that day in the third grade, is that's advocacy as well. So it, it's, it, it goes so many different levels and um, different avenues. And if it doesn't happen at the local level, it will never, never happen at the national level. So that, that small a is really so important. I think it's also interesting how you both talk about the impact of collaboration and storytelling. Did that shift? So Lynn, you were just talking about the shift in people realizing that it's not just about at the legislative level. Did that shift happen at the same time those budget crises were happening in the early 2000s, 2008? Or was that, what What caused that shift, do you think, into being aware of the power of storytelling? Probably for, at least for me and the leaders that I communicated with and were, were hanging out with at that time, were, it was more of a um, reaction, probably, not necessarily. It was a reaction and then proactive. That what we're doing isn't, is helping a small bit. It's keeping music in some of the schools, but there's more going on. We, we need more support at the grassroots level. And so that I think it just morphed into that. And at least for me, when I, when I was working for that two years on my book, I my goal was to write a book that would be helpful for the teacher that is in the trenches, as some, sometimes people say, rather than a university text that maybe 10 classes across the country would use. It's great if they do, but that it was to help people at every level, oh, oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I would hear this. I'm just an elementary music teacher. I teach K through five. I'm too busy. I don't have enough to abdicate. I have no, I don't have any time. And I've been there. I, I did teach that, and so I understand how busy their lives are. I wanted to give them something you can advocate every time that you do any music with your students and talk to a parent. And there are little things that you can do, but micro steps will still get you up a mountain eventually. So. I love that micro steps visualization, one step forward. It's all you have to do. So Lynn, you've given us some great resources from your textbook. Robin, can you touch on some of the resources that we compiled during the pandemic specifically related to the ACDA COVID-19 document and how those resources could still be useful today? Yeah, there was a lot of work done um, by the committee, by Lynn in particular, actually, for the COVID-19 document that ACDA put together. It was something that came together on high speed when uh, ACDA leadership realized uh, this is something that was going to be with us and we really needed to serve the membership. And I'll tell you, the team of people that put it together were incredible, and it's truly one of the best documents online. Uh, There is a a a good section, a solid section about specifically advocacy. Um, Again, speaking about how you can communicate with administrators, with parents. Um, But then there are a lot of ideas throughout the entire document about survival during COVID-19, which certainly apply to now. And honestly, good teaching, engaging our students, making sure the parents are aware of everything we are doing, that that becomes advocacy. So even though the large document may not be advocacy focused, because it's such a solid document, it truly is advocacy in every way because it's strengthening the field and that's advocating. I think that's so perfectly said. And for the students that are listening, like the music ed students that I know I have my students listen quite often, this is such a hard thing to transfer, to explain in a methods class. In addition to finding all the right music and preparing all the right procedures and sequencing, you must also stand up and advocate for your program, even though you don't feel comfortable talking to parents or administrators or walking out in your community. Like, this is such a great sentence and a great place to send them, both Lynn's book, the COVID-19 document of resources on the ACDA website. There's tons of things. A little bit of Oh, Can ahead, I say, I, I applaud you for bringing advo- advocacy. I keep stumbling on the words. Sorry, it's like <laughs> I've never said it before. Um, I applaud you for bringing advocacy to your students. Too many of our universities are not bringing it to our undergrads. So they graduate and they have the skills to lead a classroom or at least the beginning skills, but they don't have the skills to speak to administrators, to speak to parents. Mm-hmm. They don't understand the importance of telling the story, getting the, getting their students to tell the story, 
And that is a huge way of keeping their programs alive and keeping it funded. Mm -hmm. So thank you for even bringing that to your students. Well, thank you so much for saying something. I almost didn't have a job my second year. My line got cut. And we had to, as a as an arts team, fight for my position. And it was that was a you know, pedal to the metal, learn how to do it type of situation. When you think about a little more institutional history, if you're listening to this and someone's like, wait, I didn't even know ACD had standing committees. And I know now some regions and some states are starting to implement standing committees. Can you give us some tips or some thoughts or just stories of how to even get started if your state or community or region are starting committees? Sure. Um, for, for the national organization, it took someone with a vision that led those standing committees into life. Um, that was Tim Sharp at the time. Um, Tim was a leader for ACDA that uh, brainstormed with his colleagues in leadership and then allowed us to take some ideas and uh, develop. He wasn't a micromanager. He was a visionary um, and helped us become visionaries in many ways. So that was wonderful. And when you are uh, trying to create that at the regional or state level, it's similar, I think, similar approach needs to be taken that it's not micromanaged, but finding ways to inspire your colleagues at that level to take their ideas and run with it and grow it and serve, um, connect, uh, learn from colleagues. Um, the best way to serve is to be open-minded and humble and uh, realize that people around you often have better ideas than you. Um, I know I surrounded myself with great people on the advocacy committee that you know, they all made me look good, but it wasn't anything about me. It was great people. And that's what leadership needs to surround themselves with great people, especially where if you think you have a weakness in an area, finding people that have that skill, and then you balance each other out. So um, I think inspiring people uh, through humility and collaboration and uh, vision is going to be a great way to get those started. I love that. Inspiring through collaboration, too. Lynn, what are you going to add to that? I'm just going to say it at the, the national level, what we found out is so much of the time, <clears throat> pardon me, and this can happen at the state level, too. The leaders have so much on their plate that 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 they're they're not able to do everything and to be able to get the people who, if you want to call it the boots on the ground. And we had task force and sometimes those task force would end up being long, long term committees but addressing particular issues with people who are living that, that same kind of an idea so that we didn't inadvertently make them a, a mistake by changing a bylaws or voting something to happen that actually would harm and inhibit people from being the best teachers possible. So getting that perspective, because the leaders have a different perspective than someone who is in a classroom and is not in leadership. And, and um, my view is you need it all. So that boots on the ground perspective is, is so valuable too. These are great stories to hear and know where these committees have come from. And the, I'd like to leave the listener with some tangible tools. So could you either share something they could do today that they could use for advocacy or share one of your favorite advocacy or collaboration stories? Well, I'll, I'll go with a story that I actually shared on a, at least one of the webinars or two that ended up being an advocacy. And this is when we were totally online. So sometimes you you do goofy things to keep kids engaged because <laughs> you're just you're just hearing a black hole. You don't get to hear anybody sing. <clears throat> and so we had a treasure hunt and um, or scavenger hunt. We had students, I gave them they they needed to find something for a wood, something for a metal. They had to have a hat, they, you know, quite a few different things, sticks that they could tap. And I gave them two minutes and I had parents email, emailing and texting, what, what's going on? My kids are screaming and yelling, running around the house, looking for things. And then we, we did some body percussion and, some, and played those different instruments to recorded music, upbeat things like happy and things like that. Well, um, my director at that time, I shared a screenshot I took of everybody with their hats on being really silly and wild because he has a couple of grandchildren that sing in the choir. 
And he sent it to the dean. It ended up being an advocacy moment. I didn't do that treasure hunt as an advocacy, but I told that story to my administrator just because I thought it was a cool thing for him to know about his grandchildren. It ended up being an advocacy. And and so the dean was so excited that the youth courses continue on, even though we were totally online. So that something like that, there are lots of ways to create advocacy. It doesn't have to be this big, huge thing that you go to Capitol Hill. As easy as a quick picture and an email and not even intentionally, just, hey, look how fun this is. Robin, what about you? Um, I would say that uh, making sure that our students are engaged, just like Lynn was sharing, um, that they're excited about what we're doing. Keep it fun. Um, Those seeds that we are planting are advocacy for the future because they are future choral singers, whether they're elementary singers going in through the school system or high school singers heading out to college or collegiate singers that are going out into the community and they are their singing in choirs or they are becoming patrons, but um, exciting them about the, the beauty of choral singing, the beauty of being together through choral music. Um, and it's a, it's a really long-term advocacy to keep them excited, keep them engaged, um, looking for ways to, help them mentor people that are coming up behind them. One of the big things that we're doing with Cincinnati Youth Choir right now is finding ways, and we're just at the beginning of our season, so it hasn't started yet, but we're finding ways to help um, bring clinicians in and support into middle schools where really middle school and elementary school choral programs have just, I think, had the biggest hit at the national level with the pandemic. And so we see our role of advocacy is to support those programs, get youth singing again, because in turn, that's going to feed into the high school programs. And yes, hopefully it'll feed into our program as well. So it's a marketing strategy as well, but it's really about keeping the choral arts alive because we all know um, being in a choir took a really big hit as an unsafe activity during the pandemic. And what could be more wholesome and affirming and uh, uh, confidence building than singing together? And so we need to get that back because 18 months has really taken that away from us. And yet it's still there. So we have to find ways to make it happen. These are great tips and great ideas. I, I know I did a gig once where a the people in charge of the honor choir invited the superintendent and the whole board of the school, the whole school board. And so one afternoon in walks this massive round of suits in the middle of rehearsal. And there was one teacher in charge of explaining what was going on. I know the same was true at my elementary school that the principal always brought guests to my room first. And you kind of establish that routine and invite them in. My principal would just come sit and hang out sometimes because it was the most, he said it was the most relaxing slash fun place to be in the whole school. So he would just come hang out and I wasn't doing that on purpose. We became great friends. And even after he retired, he's one of my biggest mentors. So I think that those little things, you don't even know you're advocating or building a collaboration until I think those are important. Hey, you guys have done such a great job today sharing the history of this and helping us fill in the holes for now and in the future and retaining that institutional history. What's one thing that really matters that you want the listener to walk away with on this episode? curveball questions you're making us think and it's early it is the music at matters podcast it, so something it has to matter it does matter and it does matter um i would say the one thing that i'm i'm passionate about always have been but probably even more so now is helping our youth connect and find their voice um to share messages to grow um, because that is such an important part of planting seeds for bringing choral music back to life. Um, And I know I already said it, but that's truly where I am right now. I'll just jump right on top of that piggyback there because I actually share this with my methods students. So ask yourself why 
we chose this profession, why we are, why we love choral music and remind our singers, our colleagues, our students, everyone, why it's so important to each one of us. And, and one of the things that going deep, deep, deep has helped me realize I, I use choral music, singing, making music to help the students that are under my watch and guidance to be better humans. Do I want them to be better musicians? Absolutely. And using this amazing tool that we have that we can connect at a level that some people never get to have these experiences that we do when we're singing with someone, that, that is so precious. And to just remind why we do this, then that passion for helping others, it's automatically going to help people start being advocates and storytellers because they want to have that for future generations. I love it. I'm so glad we have this story too for future generations. I wanted to make sure we captured it as we're now transitioning and you two led the way as chairs of the first ACDA standing committee for advocacy and collaboration. And I'm um, excited to jump forward and take over as chair. And I'm really thankful that you're both willing to share these stories and be a part of the ongoing history of advocacy and collaboration. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm honored. And you are doing a fabulous job. So, we, you know, we, we started the path and you're taking it off and putting it on, on steroids. So good for you. <laughs> Can't wait to see what's next. Y'all are the best. Thanks. There is power in your story. I hope that you see today ways that you can advocate in your school, in your community, and in the world at large. I hope you know the unlimited amount of resources at your fingertips. You are not alone. And it is so interesting to look back and see all the people that have laid the groundwork before us and all the people that we get to lay the groundwork that are coming after us. This world of music, it's so connected and I'm so thankful to be doing it with you. If you're looking to join the community, check it out. Check us out at patreon.com slash musicedmatters. If you just want to join the conversation, there's lots of ways to join over there, including our monthly meetups where we just get together and talk about things like what do we need to advocate about or what are you doing in rehearsal or what warm-ups are you using? It's a lot of fun. Above all else, I want you to know that what you're doing matters. We all know that music matters, especially advocacy and collaboration. And I'll see you next time on the Music It Matters podcast.